Ageless one, your word is timeless. Your word never changes. We live in our particular culture and time, and we hear your word speaking to our moment in time. Open our minds and hearts on this day to absorb your word for us all. Amen. The scripture this morning is taken from 1 Timothy chapter 4, verses 1 through 6 and 9 through 10. And the translation is by Wilda Gaffney. Now, the Spirit expressly says that in the latter time, some will leave the faith by paying attention to deceitful spirits and teaching of demons through the hypocrisy of liars whose consciences are seared with a hot iron. They forbid marriage and de demand abstinence from foods, which God created for receiving with thanksgiving by those who believe and know the truth. For everything created by God is good, and nothing for rejection, rather received with thanksgiving. For it is sanctified by God's word and by prayer. Lay these things out to the sisters and brothers. You will be a good servant of Christ Jesus, nourished on the words of the faith and of the good teaching that you have followed. This is a faithful saying and worthy of acceptance. Therefore, for this we toil and struggle, because we hope in the living God, who is savior of all people, especially of those who believe. The word of God. So when we get to these very personal letters included in our New Testament, I start to wonder for myself how a similar letter might be worded if it were written to us today. The letters to Timothy and Titus are meant to instruct and encourage some individual church leaders in how to care for the church. Timothy is a third-generation Christian. His grandmother, Lois, was converted to Christianity through the preaching of Paul. And then his mother, Eunice, has seen to it that he was steeped in the message of, the Jesus, of Jesus for his whole life. As we often find in the various books of the Bible, neither the date of the writing of these letters nor the author of these letters are actually agreed upon by all New Testament scholars. Some of them are confident that these letters are indeed from Paul's hand to his young mentees, Timothy and Titus. Perhaps they were written then very close to his death under Emperor Nero, estimated to be around 67 CE. Other scholars point to the use of a different vocabulary, different theology, and even different writing style from Paul's other letters as being indicators that the letters are actually written by someone who used Paul's name in an honorific way using this common pseudepigraphic practice could mean that the letter was written much later, actually, maybe even in the early second century. Same purpose, the purpose to guide and uphold the continued growth and development of the Christian church in Asia and in Europe. Even if we do take the earlier date the letters are written three decades after Jesus' resurrection and ascension. Thanks in a large part to the Apostle Paul, by this time the Christian church has spread and developed. And as new generations have arrived now, it was becoming more and more obvious that Jesus' return was not as imminent as they had thought. Toward the end of the Gospel of Matthew, we find one of Jesus' teachings at the, about the end times and the return of the Son of Man. 
After listing these signs of the end that they should be watching for, Jesus tells his listeners the human one, or the Son of Man, is near at the door. I assure you that this generation won't pass away until all these things happen, he said. Well, as, the writing, as of the writing of these letters to Timothy and Titus, the Son of Man had not returned. A part of that generation had passed away. So now the church needed some direction and guidance for the coming decades with a different understanding of what to expect because the return of Christ was maybe not coming tomorrow. So there arose a need for them to organize themselves, to train leaders, and to find ways that they can effectively pass along the Christian message and avoid following false doctrines that were swirling around them. Paul's words offer counsel to Timothy as he leads a congregation of believers. Paul knows that some of them are going to fall away from their faith and become attracted to other kinds of spiritual movements. In the section of the letter that we heard this morning, he insists that because all of God's created gifts are good, they should be received with thanksgiving. The Christian brothers and sisters should not be misled and go off path by people who insist they have to remain celibate, or people who insist that they can't eat certain kinds of food. The Christians, brothers and sisters, cannot forget those words at the very beginning of the Hebrew Bible, the first chapter of Genesis. God saw everything that he had made, and it was supremely good. Timothy is told he needs to lay out this message to the church members, don't be misled by false doctrines, but instead be nourished by the word of the faith and on good teaching. Then you will be good servants of Christ. This letter we call it 1 Timothy because there's a second letter that gets called 2 Timothy. This letter is from an experienced evangelist and preacher giving advice to a younger mentee coming along up behind him. I want to read for you the verses that follow the section of the letter that we read this morning. Listen to verses 11 through 16 of chapter 4. He's speaking to Timothy. Command these things. Teach them. Don't let anyone look down on you because you are young. Instead, set an example for the believers through your speech, behavior, love, faith, and by being sexually pure. Until I arrive, pay attention to public reading, preaching, and teaching. Don't neglect the spiritual gift in you that was given through prophecy when the elders laid hands on you. Practice these things and live by them so that your progress will be visible to all. Focus on working on your own development and on what you teach. If you do this, you will save yourself and those who hear you. You hear that Paul encourages Timothy to not let anyone look down on him because he's young, but instead to be an example for believers in the way he lives. I think he could just as well have written similar words of encouragement to an older disciple, perhaps. He could have said, don't let anyone look down on you because you're old. When a disciple leads by example and continues to develop his or her own faith, not remaining static, 
when a disciple continues to develop a deeper understanding of the Christian message, then it should be obvious to the congregation that he or she is worth listening to. Timothy should insist on reading, preaching, and teaching as essential elements of congregational life. He should put his spiritual gifts to use. Seems like this kind of letter would be kept, perhaps, and reread at times when Timothy was confused or unclear as to his next steps. Or maybe when he was weary with the tasks of ministry. Or maybe when there were threats to the healthy life of the congregation rising up from within or from outside. Well, maybe it's a letter that we should reread as well. I wonder what a letter like this would say to us today. It doesn't have to be a letter just for a pastor or a church leader, although pastors clearly could use a letter like this one. It doesn't have to be a letter just for the elected elders in our congregation, although they need reminders too, like this. I believe this can be a letter to any one of us, to anyone who continues to be a part of a church family in any place and any time. Paul's words at the beginning of the letter to Timothy apply to all of us. All we need is ongoing encouragement, teaching us how to behave in this household of God, the church of the living God. In our reading this morning, this is reiterated. We toil and struggle, and I think that means in our faith and for our church family. We toil and struggle because we hope in the living God, who is Savior of all people. We'll say that again. We toil and struggle because we hope in the living God, the Savior of all people. So what might a letter like this include if it were written to you? I'm going to try this morning to put some words together. Maybe it might read like this. From Deborah, a servant of Jesus Christ. To, and you put your name in that blank, to a disciple of the Lord. May the grace of Christ Jesus, our Lord, the ongoing mercy of God, our heavenly parent, and the lasting peace of the Holy Spirit be with you and in you this day and every day. You've already received the true message of Jesus Christ, maybe from your mother, maybe from your pastor, maybe from a friend. You have the blessing of easy access to read and reread the words of life in our Holy Scriptures. Maybe it's in your Bible in a hard copy you hold in your hand, or maybe it's on your phone. Read those Scriptures. Meditate on those Scriptures. The living God, the Savior of all people, speaks to each of you through those Scriptures. Be careful about those who might try to pull you away from enjoying the fruit of God's creation, maybe telling you that some things are off limits. True believers know that God has gifted us with everything God has created, period. You read at the very beginning of the Hebrew scriptures, God saw everything that he had made and it was supremely good. For these gifts, you must be thankful, praising and giving thanks to the giver God. 
Maybe there are people who try to pull you away by promising financial blessings or increased social status as a reward for particular behaviors or acts, like maybe giving money to the church. Be careful, because it can be easy to slip into that way of thinking. Then we start to think God gives us a higher paying job or a chance to retire early because God shows us favor in particular, or because we earned it somehow, or even worse, because we think we deserve it. And I mean deserving it because we've been faithful in prayer or in worship attendance, not deserving it because of your track record that you have for doing a good job in your profession or the extra studying you've done to advance yourself. Those are reasons to receive promotions and additional pay. We call this kind of message today the prosperity gospel. And I know you've heard it espoused on TV and on the internet. Don't listen to them either. You might ask them if you have an opportunity. Do you give your time and your money and your stuff so you will receive something? Or do you give your time and your money and your stuff because you love God? There's a difference, my church family. There's a difference. Build healthy relationships within your family and with your friends and give thanks to God. Appreciate whatever food is available to you as a gift and not a right of some kind. And share that food so that others can also give thanks to God for something to eat. Remain committed to the family of Christ wherever you are. Do not neglect participating together in the worship and praise of God in person or on Zoom. Learning together and working together. For you are sisters and brothers in Christ. Above all, remember always that our hope comes from God. And our God is the living God, present in our midst. The God who sent God's only Son to save us from the effect of our sins. The God whose goal is reconnection and reconciliation with all of creation. Our God is the living God who never gives up on us, who wants us to respond with love and commitment, compassion, and grace. You are a member of the family of Jesus Christ. Together with your other sisters and brothers in this particular part of the family we call Hunting Ridge, you face all kinds of roadblocks, detours, sharp turns in your faith journey, Keep together. Keep your focus. Trust in God today and every day. In the name of our living God, may grace be with you all. That ends the potential letter to you, Hunting Ridge. Amen. Let us sing together, God be the love to search and keep me, one of my favorites.
Of song. 